Okay, cool. Let's see. Okay. Ashley, I think as a sound that we are launching. Okay. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jim Ox. I serve as the curator of education at Connecticut Spiritually Zoo. And tonight is my pleasure to introduce an, an especially exciting talk from an expert in, our, in the field. Tonight, we're going to be exploring the Olympic Cougar Project in the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. And our guest speaker is Mr. Kurt Zayas, Panthera field technician. Uh, Kurt has a wealth of experience. I'm going to profile it right now. Cougars on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State may be threatened by genetic isolation as highways and housing development rapidly expands in the region. Panthera, a nonprofit research organization, is collaborating with several tribal partners across the peninsula to help better understand the risk of population fragmentation to cougars also widely known as mountain lions or pumas. Since, 20, since 2018, this group has led a large-scale effort to track cougar dispersal, identify potential blockages in wildlife corridors, and recommend future policy changes to make highways more friendly to wildlife. To Join the like field technician with Panthera as right, he shares his experiences with the cougar project, including close-up right. encounters with the gaps right. themselves. At this time, I ask that you all please mute yourselves and turn off all of your devices other than your laptop or whatever you're viewing on. Thanks for joining us. And Kurt, take it away. Great. Uh, thank you, Jim. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kurt Zayas. Um, I wanted to first thank the folks at the Beardsley Zoo for inviting me to present, including Tracy and Jim. Um, yeah, so I work for Panthera. We are a nonprofit. Uh, organization focused on the conservation of wild bats worldwide. And I work in Panthera's Puma program, and I'm a field technician working on our Olympic Cougar project. Uh, so for those of you who uh, don't know, the Olympic Cougar project is a large collaborative study on uh, cougars in the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. Uh, so back in 2018, the Lower Elwha Column Tribe uh, teamed up with Panthera to aid their cougar monitoring program. And eventually, a total of six tribal nations uh, across the peninsula joined this effort, as well as several universities hosting graduate students using data from this project. So the Olympic Peninsula, our study area, is located in the northwest corner of uh, Washington State. And uh, this slide shows the tribal areas where uh, our cougar study occurs, and our six tribal partners on this project are the Lower Ella Column Tribe, um, sort of in the north central part of the peninsula, and then working clockwise, the Jamestown Sklalem Tribe, the Port Gamble Sklalem Tribe, the Skokomish Tribe, the Quinault Tribe, and the Macaw Tribe. Um, these tribal partners are interested in preserving wildlife and habitat for the next seven generations. Uh, this management plan is used by these tribes to guide the sustainable use of natural resources, including cougars. So when we talk about the importance of preserving wildlife, where do cougars fit in? Why do they deserve the spotlight? And why are they important? Uh, recent studies theorize that cougars are ecosystem engineers, meaning they modify and manage their habitats by controlling food resources for other species. Uh, this graphic uh, shows us um, some elements of why mountain lions are ecosystem engineers. Um, a study in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem showed that cougars provide food resources for 39 vertebrate species uh, uh, scavenging cougar kills. Um, this is a video of uh, a Pacific fisher scavenging an elk kill here on the Olympic Peninsula. And let me know if you can't see or hear the video to try to work with that. Um, a lot of you on the East Coast are probably very familiar with fishers. Uh, on the West uh, here in, in the Olympic Peninsula, there, uh, it wasn't that long ago that they were um, 
extirpated from the area and reintroduced recently. So it's really exciting to see them utilizing these uh, hill sites. So in addition to being ecosystem engineers, cougars provide benefits to people and their ability to control deer populations and by extension, deer vehicle collisions. So if reestablished in the Eastern US, cougars could reduce deer vehicle collisions by 22%, preventing over 20,000 human injuries and preventing 155 human deaths and save about $2 billion in property damage associated with uh, those collisions in the next 30 years after reestablishment. So how do we study this important species in the Olympic Peninsula? Um, our focus is on the following topics. Uh, abundance, so estimating how many cougars are out there on the landscape. Connectivity, how are Olympic cougars connected or disconnected from uh, other populations in the state. And uh, general ecology, so assessing diet, microhabitat preferences, and many more aspects. So let's start with estimating abundance and um, when the Lower Elwha Klallam tribe first teamed up with Panthera, they wanted to find a cost-effective, safer, non-invasive method to monitor their six culturally important species. Those are bear, coyote, cougar, bobcat, black-tailed deer, and Roosevelt duck. And after discussing with other wildlife biologists, they determined they determined that they would estimate abundance and density using camera grids. And in the wildlife biology field, we uh, are moving away from the traditional, more expensive sampling methods like collaring and helicopter accounts for elk. And this, uh, this map here shows the uh, initial study area for this camera grid and the pished GMU, which is uh, this sort of north central portion of the peninsula. And each one of these points represents a single camera um, that has been randomly placed uh, uh, along the grid um, in the study area. Um, camera grids are a newer method for estimating population size for wildlife species. So to validate our camera grid model, we simultaneously ran scat dogs in the camera grid areas. And these scat dog teams have trained their dogs to sniff out wildlife scat and we can also collect this scat for genetic analysis. Um, we had scat dogs come out to sample in the Pish GMU area in 2018, 2019, and 2020. And a total of 165 cougar scats were identified using these scat dogs. Um, so our preliminary density estimates using this camera grid uh, are out now from 2018 to 2020. Um, that first year, about 0.6 cougars per 100 square miles is a pretty low number, and uh, we believe this was due to a number of factors, including camera malfunctions, heavy snow in 2018, and heavy hunting in the uh, GMU area. Uh, but after 2018, the numbers started to line up more of what we expected, around 1.5 to 2 cougars per 100 square kilometers. Um, uh, but that first number was also... Uh, it made sense with what we were seeing in the field uh, in terms of cougar activity in the area. And these numbers also line up well with our scat dog survey results. So the camera grid model appears to work. And now as our project has grown with more collaborators, we have expanded our camera grids from the Pish area in 2019 to now include camera grids and travel treaty lands that nearly surround the Olympic National Park. Uh, so we have about 450 and 475 cameras out currently. Um, Panthera is developing a software called Panthera IDS, which both organizes camera trap data and utilizes artificial intelligence to classify species from camera trap images. So this program could take an image of this Roosevelt elk and identify this individual as a Roosevelt elk and uh, categorize that uh, data file away in our database. Um, that prevents a lot of time and effort of an individual person going through these photos and identifying what species are in there. Our goal is to have a species identifier with very high success. Um, and right now we're in the process of retraining that classifier to improve accuracy. But we hope to use that program in the future 
analyze our massive data sets and photos. Now let's move on to the second project goal of understanding connectivity to the lower cascades. So this map here shows uh, part of Washington state. This is the Olympic Peninsula, the Northwest portion of this map. And the Southeast portion shows uh, the foothills leading up to the Cascade Mountain Range. Um, and this black line that runs right through the middle is Interstate 5. Uh, Interstate 5 was completed in the late 1960s and it completely bisects the area between the Olympic Mountain Range and the Cascade Mountain Range. Um, this map was produced by our partners at the Washington Department of Transportation and it shows both mapped cougar habitat, green uh, being suitable and red being uh, not very suitable, and linkages on highways with traffic impact. So each one of these uh, points purple, blue, and white, they all represent potential linkage zones where uh, we could put, uh, or rather the state could uh, install uh, wildlife corridors. And as you can see, uh, everywhere, pretty much everywhere along I-5 is going to be uh, a high traffic area, somewhere between uh, 10,000 and 76,000 vehicles per day traveling on this road. And that is also true even for a smaller highway like uh, uh, Highway 8, which heads out towards the coast. This still, we are seeing um, over 10,000 vehicles traveling uh, on this highway per day. So a recent genetic study published in June found that the Olympic Peninsula cougars have the lowest genetic diversity and the highest inbreeding coefficients um, among all cougar populations in Washington state. And the authors suggest that action should be taken to prevent inbreeding and to bolster the genetic health of Olympic cougars. Uh, so as you can see from this, I-5 does pose a huge problem for wildlife attempting to cross. So what would it look like if we added a wildlife corridor to I-5? Well, we can see plenty of examples um, from another corridor project in Washington state along I-90, which is in Snoqualmie Pass. Um, this, uh, this is a series of overpasses and underpasses that were uh, uh, have been and are currently being installed on the highway. Um, and that includes this overpass here and this underpass with um, evidence of elk traveling underneath. And this uh, I-90 project has been a huge success. We're seeing tons and tons of wildlife uh, accessing these uh, corridors. So part of our job is to ground truth those potential linkage locations that we're seeing on that map a couple slides ago using data from our collared cougars. Um, this graphic shows one of our uh, collared cougars, Al, approaching I-5 several times with the intention of crossing, um, but he does not end up successfully dispersing that direction. And he moves uh, both in that northern linkage area and then also down in that southern linkage area. He continues to try to cross east and he cannot because uh, I-5 poses a huge barrier to his movement. Um, now, really exciting news uh, this year on June 25th, around 4 a.m., one of our male cougars, Floki, who recently dispersed from his mother, crossed not only Highway 8, which is a formidable feat in itself, but also I-5. And Floki is continuing his journey east towards the Cascades now. Um, so by this time, we've collared um, upwards of 120 cougars over the last five years on this project. And the takeaway here should be that Floki uh, is an exception. His journey was no doubt made incredibly difficult by I-5 in this state uh, without uh, uh, suitable corridors leading to the other side. So imagine how many more cougars would have successfully dispersed to the Cascades or vice versa if we had a series of wildlife corridors uh, in these key linkage zones. 
this is just a some a fun video that I added of um, Floki at a kill site for leaving mom uh, just a couple months before. Uh, Floki used the cooter moving towards the camera with the collar, and his mom is in the background, uh, uncollared and uh, eating a deer carcass. And here's some more footage of Floki um, attempting to share a meal with his sister, who we also have collared. But he doesn't seem very willing to share right now. <laughs> so last but not least, uh, we're interested in learning everything we can about the ecology of our Olympic cougars. We use uh, GPS collars to capture information about dispersing cougars through this GPS data. Uh, we have the largest number of um, collar dispersals in the study, over 40 individual dispersing cougars. Um, in an attempt to document the movement of dispersers, we focus on first collaring females and then waiting for them to den, uh, and then waiting for their, um, their young to get old enough to the point where we can collar them as well. So this allows us to follow the lives of these cougars from dependency all the way to the point where they have their own established homages. During uh, capture events, we work with houndsmen who train their hounds to split off and individually tree entire family groups. So there will be a couple of hounds at the base of a tree uh, barking up at a, a female, adult female at the top. And then there will be another hound 50 meters this way uh, at the base of another tree with a kitten up there. And then another hound 50 meters over here with another kitten at the top of that tree. So we time these family group collaring events by monitoring when females are dead, and then we track uh, when their subadults are old enough to collar. And with so many cougars in hand, we're gaining unique insights into their growth rates as well as estimating their ages through dentition. So this uh, photo at the uh, sort of top right shows very clearly a young kitten, uh, probably a couple weeks old, um, with no teeth grown in it. And this cougar at the uh, bottom left is uh, um, an interesting case. This is a, a milk tooth, a deciduous milk tooth that uh, uh, grows in early on and a, uh, an adult canine growing in kind of at the same spot, um, this transition period of about six or eight months old. Uh, cougars will have this. And then uh, over here on the bottom right, we have another cougar probably uh, 10 months old with a, uh, you know, just the adult canines growing, no deciduous milk teeth. So here are some dispersal patterns shown by some of our collared cougars on this project. Um, and you can see they uh, widely vary. Some of them pass through high elevation, uh, the high ele elevation park interior um, before establishing a home range. Some of them across major highways. Uh, some of them swim across islands um, and establish in uh, completely different areas. They all seem to have their own pattern. The collar data gives us insights into many aspects, including uh, what prey species are preferred for these cougars, understanding how often they eat, uh, what if any cor corridors are being used, um, assessing patterns of depredation and their effects on the uh, population and understanding patterns of disease and rodenticide exposure. Um, our collar data is organized and managed in software called Earth Ranger. Uh, this software allows us to visualize both the historical and the real-time data. And so we can zoom into our um, study area and we can see cougars that are currently online. So we can see Diana, Lady, Isaiah, all of these are cougars that are currently online. We could also uh, uh, look at our own Garmin and Reach devices to see um, that we use for our own personal safety to make sure that our staff are safe in the field. Um, 
We can look at the uh, movement patterns of these individual cougars. That's what all those black lines are. We can also view the uh, cougar movement patterns in a heat map form. So we can see where these cougars uh, tend to spend the most time within their range. And we can also uh, search for alerts that uh, uh, indicate when important events happen. For example, uh, when two cougars pass by each other in close proximity. So if two cougars are within 100 or 200 meters of one another, we can get alerts and we can um, monitor what that, uh, that activity means. Sometimes we'll get a uh, colored male and a colored female all of a sudden spending a lot of time together and moving to the same kills together. And oftentimes that can indicate courtship is happening. We can also get uh, alerts for important events like when a cougar crosses into the Olympic National Park boundary, or um, when cougars cross major uh, roads and highways like Interstate 5. So a large part of my job as a technician is to investigate clusters. So what is a cluster? Uh, like I mentioned before, our callers have a GPS function and they leave a coordinate on average every hour. Um, this way we can both track uh, movement data of these cougars and see when they stop in one area for an extended period of time. Um, these densely packed coordinates are called clusters. Um, clusters indicate when something interesting is happening, uh, whether it's a spot where a cougar bedded down for a few hours or made a deer kill. Uh, when we investigate these clusters, we use GPS units, and we find these individual coordinates, and from there, uh, we search for a cougar sign. So this is an example of sign we might find in the field searching these clusters. This is a matrix of small downed trees and logs creating a perfect hiding spot for a cougar. Underneath this uh, complex of perched logs, we see a depression in the ground that indicates where a cougar bedded down. There's also some hair uh, both inside the bed and snagged on a twig entering the site here. And once we find the sign, we use an app called CyberTracker to submit data forms explaining what we found, what habitat features were present, attaching photos, etc. cetera. Uh, we've connected this CyberTracker app with our Earth Ranger software, so that as soon as uh, we enter data into this data form, it'll show up on Earth Ranger. Speaking of CyberTracker, our work involves deep knowledge of interpreting animal sign, like the cougar bed pictured earlier and these cougar tracks on the beach. It's very important for us to be able to differentiate cougar tracks from dog tracks and uh, cougar beds from deer beds. So the process of interpreting animal tracks and sign can often come with a steep learning curve. And CyberTracker, a nonprofit conservation organization, has developed an intensive evaluation system, testing one's skills at identifying animal tracks and sign. Our staff members are tested annually using this in-field evaluation. And this helps provide us with exceptional observer reliability when we're doing clusters. So we also selectively investigate kill sites and set up game cameras in this, these spots. Um, when we go into these active kill site clusters, we obtain a lot of information. We can establish if collared female has kittens and how many kittens. Uh, we can also see these cougars interacting with scavengers, like this uh, cougar kitten uh, cautiously watching a spotted skunk scavenge from a deer kill. And this is really interesting because spotted skunks are one of our most common scavenging species at kill sites, uh, but we almost never see cougars uh, killing and eating spotted skunks, probably because of their um, very effective defense mechanisms.
And then, uh, oops, Let's see if we can play this. May not be able to play this file. Hmm. Well, may not be able to play this video. It's very cool. Um, this is a spotted skunk doing a uh, sort of defensive posturing, standing up on its uh, front feet and um, having the tail up. Uh, it was probably was triggered by the light from the camera, um, causing this spotted skunk to freak out and think that something was trying to attack it. And I've got some other videos here that may not have worked. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Just some more scavengers. We have bobcats are a really common scavenger um, of cougar kills. Usually after the cougar has left, uh, the kill bobcat will come in and uh, cache this the carcass and continue eating from it. Um, bald eagles are also a fairly common um, scavenger. There's also a raven in this video background there. And black bears are super common scavengers. Uh, something that we often see is uh, black bears, um, or something that we, we see sometimes is black bears uh, coming into cougar active cougar kills and kicking cougars off of that kill. And that's because cougar is um, evolved uh, being, being sort of a subordinate predator in this world of larger bears and wolves. Um, and uh, so they still hold on to that, uh, uh, that knowledge of, I need to uh, let this bear take the kill and go and find another kill for myself. Let's see, this one works. Uh, so when a female co uh, cougar has chosen a den location, we also set up game cameras at the door. And this allows us to get an accurate count of kittens to understand survival probability. This is really important. Um, so when we come into a den, sometimes we'll find uh, three kittens there, a set of cameras, um, and we'll um, wait another few months for these kittens to get older <laughs> and um, be able to walk around uh, along with mom going to kill sites. And we'll set up cameras at uh, kill sites a few months after that den, and then we can see how many kittens have made it so far, um, how many kittens are left after that initial den. Um, and uh, we continue tracking that uh, survival probability uh, throughout um, the lives of these young uh, cougar kittens. Um, I wanted to end on a note that might uh, strike a little closer to home for uh, some of you living on the, the East Coast there. Um, so excluding the Florida Everglades, cougars are no longer found in the Eastern US, but we are seeing a slow, gradual movement eastward. Um, a paper published last year by a Panthera scientist, Veronica Jovovich, among others, uh, worked to identify areas of suitable habitat along this eastward path. So 17 areas were identified from the upper Midwest to New England. And these areas were rated using a habitat suitability index, which takes into account several factors, um, not just including cougar, potential cougar habitat, but also human density and livestock presence and sociocultural values and uh, public land. Um, so for those of you that live close to the Beardsley Zoo area, I have highlighted uh, with a star the general area where the uh, Beardsley Zoo is. And you can see it's really not too far from uh, potential cougar habitat. Um, the authors concluded that ample habitat exists in the eastern US to support cougars, and they suggested proactive efforts should be taken to help residents avoid the negative impacts of these cougars and to promote coexistence. With that, I wanna thank everyone for listening to my talk and I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. Kurt, thank you, that's great. Um, <clears throat> what I would like to do at this time, I would like folks to um, please type your questions into the chat box. 
and I will find all those questions. Kurt, you don't deal with multiple audio and um, audio issues. Sorry, could you repeat that last part? And uh, while we're waiting for folks to answer, yeah, what I what I will do, I will have everybody type their questions, please, into the chat box, and I will read your question. I will read the questions out to you, Kurt. That should streamline things. Did Great. everybody? Buddy, did you copy that? That come through. Awesome. Okay. Um, Kurt from Lisa, right off the bat, you briefly mentioned how technicians say safety. Can you explain that a little more? I'm sorry. Could you repeat that one more time? Yes. You briefly mentioned how technicians stay safe in the field. Can you explain a little more? Yeah, definitely. So, um, in fact, I can go back to that slide. So we use um, what's called in-reach in -reach devices, which um, are essentially GPS devices that just track your movements. Um, and uh, we can also use the de these devices and connect them with our phones. And we can send text messages, uh, even when we're way out of service in the back country, we can send a text message saying, uh, you know, we just got to the campsite, we're all good. Um, let's see. If, yeah, this this was the graphic that um, explained that. But essentially, um, on Earth Ranger, we could also see where individual people are. So, like my coworker Andy, we could see like his tracks where where he uh, he was hiking around. Um, and uh, when this, this is especially helpful. Um, when we're in the back country or when we're camping outside of service, uh, we can send a message uh, to other people, letting them know that we're, we're all good. I'll move back down. Oops, there we go. Okay. Um Okay, Kurt, next up, uh, Kathy had asked, why are cougars moving east? Um, that's a good question. So, so cougars uh, historically occupied um, essentially all, uh, I mean, we can go back to that graphic, but that's this whole, all this uh, uh, light green area was also cougar habitat and they also lived in these areas. Um, uh, Cougars were extirpated just from heavy hunting in this in this region because it was it was colonized first uh, by um, initially by by Europeans and so that that uh, whole area got hit really hard by hunting early on. Um, why they're moving east? I think that cougars um, are just inclined to disperse where there is good habitat. There's still clearly according to that paper there's still good habitat in these areas. Um, and so cougars will continue moving those directions now that hunting is not so extreme uh, as it was, um, you know, uh, back when the early settlers were arriving and throughout the 1800s and early 1900s. Um, so, so they're colonized, they're recolonizing these areas because there's that lack of um, uh, hunting pressure. Well, not not complete lack, but there is more of a lack of, of hunting pressure. And uh, those habitat features still exist. There's still deer, there are still forests. Great, thank you, Kurt. Ginny uh, wanted to know, how are you addressing the lack of genetic diversity in your limited area? Yeah, so the lack of genetic diversity in the Olympic uh, Peninsula, um, that is, um, Essentially, that's that's why we are studying these linkage zones along I five. So, so we are essentially the research component of that conservation issue. We're looking at how are cougars able or not able to cross. Um, and as because we're we're simply a research based organization, uh, we don't really get into uh, the uh, the business of like moving cougars back and forth. We're just studying them. Um, the the main uh, the major way that we're going to be able to uh, uh, help that uh, that issue of, of genetic 
isolation and uh, low genetic diversity is going to be installing these um, uh, wildlife corridors along I-5. And um, that's something that we're working with Washington State biologists on. That's something that uh, we're, we're providing the data for that. Um, and we're, we're making a case for this being a large issue. Um, but that's, um, that's, we're just one component there. There are, there are a lot of other agencies. There are a lot of other organizations involved with that. Great, great. Thank you for that. Yeah, that, that's um, a vexing problem. Uh, Kathy had also asked for if there if there is any concern about COVID. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that last part? If there's any concern for uh, about COVID infecting wild cougars. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah. So when uh, when the pandemic be, began, uh, I wasn't working at Panther at that time, but we were using um, masks, uh, face masks when, and, and gloves. We always wear gloves when we're handling uh, animals, but um, uh, we were taking a lot of precautions to um, prevent COVID from passing for these animals. Um, uh, as far as I understand, there is um, a very low risk uh, from, from uh, transmitting for transmitting COVID to to cougars, and so we're not wearing masks anymore. But we still definitely wear gloves. That's, that's super important. Um, yeah, there there is there is some level of risk there, but uh, but yeah, with with the gloves on, that that can help a lot. Great. I know that we have discovered a lot about transmission with COVID in mammals in the last two years. So. Thank you for that insight. Uh, Jonah wanted to know, do cougars live with any other cats native to North, Central, South America, other than jaguars and cats? I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? Sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. I know my, my audio is not great tonight. Do cougars live with any other cats native to America, other than jaguars and bobcats? Do they, do they mate with other cats? So is that the question? Do they do they cohabitate? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So so cougars. I mean, we find them uh, in the same habitats as bobcat. Absolutely. Um, and then, yeah, and in areas where, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I I guess I can only speak to our our region really. Um, that we definitely find them in bobcat habitat as well. We find bobcats um, scavenging on their kills a lot. Um, lynx, I'm not sure if they would, I think there would be um, uh, like a hard limit on uh, elevation that would prevent cougars and lynx from mostly sharing habitat. Um, um, yeah, uh, and I honestly, I can't really speak to other uh, wildcats in North and South America. I uh, can only really speak to the, uh, North American uh, cats here, so so definitely the bobcats they'll they'll um, they'll occupy the same habitats. Thank you. Okay, a lot of questions here, and I'm doing my best, guys, to uh, get the intonation and the the details regarding this. I'm trying to read them verbatim. In your research, what surprised you most from Gene? Most from from genome work. Gene wants to know what surprised you most in your research. Got it. Um, gosh, that's a really good question. So I've only been working for Panthera for one year, so I can only provide so much insight here. Um, something that I think uh, has been surprising in general in Cougar research over the past few years is how um, uh, we used to think that cougars were incredibly individualistic and they did not share kills with um, other individuals that uh, you know, weren't related to them uh, or you know, weren't their um, you know, mate or, or part of the same litter. But something that we do see is um, 
cougars will occasionally share kills um, with with other cougars, even ones that they are only distantly related to. Um, something uh, that's really interesting is if if a cougar were to share a kill uh, with another cougar that it, they didn't already know, they weren't siblings. Um, they are eleven times more likely to share a kill with that same individual after that point. Um, that's kind of a really interesting uh, um, realization I think that we've had in this field is that that cougars just aren't as individualistic um, as we thought. That's an amazing stat. Thank you. Okay, um, Ariel wanted to know, is the success of wildlife corridors in other countries being used to advocate for wildlife corridors for cougars? Um, is a success for wildlife corridors in other countries? Uh, and then after, after that, I didn't hear. Is, is the success of wildlife corridors in other countries being used to advocate for wildlife corridors for cougars? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, there are a number of um, good examples in Canada um, as well of uh, cougar or of uh, corridors, I should say, uh, being extremely um, um, beneficial to wildlife and cougars. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, the data is there, especially that I-90 project that I referenced that, um, uh, that is definitely, even though that is in the United States, um, that's really a, a fantastic example of a, a well-designed corridor study. Um, and we're, we're seeing cougars using that corridor as well. We're seeing uh, moose, we're seeing um, all sorts of uh, wildlife using those, those corridors. Um, I'm, outside of uh, Canada and the US, I'm not really sure. Um, I'm not sure I could speak to other countries that use that same approach. That's great to know that it's, it's so effective. Um, Mike wanted to know, is the Florida panther really a cougar subspecies? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, um, that is, uh, what's, uh, what the, the, the genetics show. So it's, um, that is, that is what, uh, what we accept in the scientific world right now. Um, but, um, you know, Florida panther, cougar, puma, mountain lion, it's all the same, uh, same species, just that Florida panther group is, is just a little bit, uh, genetically distinct enough. Um, to be to be subspecies. Thank you. Yeah, the, the Florida panther gets a lot of press in the east. Thanks for clarifying that. Uh, Deanna wanted to know how do you get photos of mom and the kids, the cubs, and their teeth? Yeah. So um, so photos of mom and the, the kittens. So those. Those photos on that slide that was those were from capture efforts. So um, so when we capture cougars, we you know we use hounds uh, to um, chase the cougars up trees, and we use a, a very safe drug uh, to to work up these cats called BAM. Uh, it's it's uh, it's it's now I think the kind of seen as the best uh, option for for uh, working up cougars and a lot of other wildlife too. Um, and yeah, essentially uh, the same thing. So with mom, with, uh, with a sub adult that's old enough to wear a collar, we'll, uh, we'll dart those cats and we'll bring them down from the tree. And, uh, then at that point, the, the cougar is, um, uh, is safe to, to work up and we can take photos of the teeth from there. Thank you. Uh I have a uh, certainly entertaining question. I have one or two of my own I'd love to add. Yeah, go for it. So uh, I will do so well. Um, how accurate is IPS? How accurate are you finding this software? Oh, the Earth Ranger. Um, uh, how how accurate is is the Earth Ranger software? Is that what you're asking? The, the, um, the software that helps you people identify the result. Oh, the Panthera IDS. Um, so I, 
I don't have numbers for that, but it's right now it is not uh, meeting our standards. We would like to have upwards of 90% ac accuracy, but uh, right now it's, it's really not there yet. Um, I, yeah, like I said, I don't have numbers, but we're not using it at this point for our data set because it's not, uh, uh, it's, yeah. We, we, so it's, there, it's using machine learning to kind of teach itself how to uh, get to the point where it's super, super accurate. Um, and that's uh, helped in a lot of other areas of wildlife research. But um, at this point, I think it's just gonna take more time for that software to get there. Thank you. Um, also, um, this are you recording or or so? Um, how often are you recording previously unknown cougars that disperse species out here? Previously unknown cougars uh, doing what? That range into your study area from maybe part east. Um. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, so we we when we call her, we tend to do this, um, you know, in in specific areas around the um, around the peninsula. Uh, we tend to do these on on private timberland or uh, an area, and specifically in areas where we have permits and, and authorization from the those uh, the tribes that we work with. Um, and so we're, we're collaring cougars that are specifically already in the peninsula. And at this point, we don't know if like, let's say we call her a two-year-old male, uh, that's in the peninsula. Um, right now we can't say, uh, you know, if that's, if that cougar originated in the Cascades, you know, uh, a few hundred miles away, um, uh, that would require us to, um, you know, do capture efforts in the Cascades and then see where those cougars go as well. Um, so yeah, we, we don't really know that. We're just kind of focusing on, um, uh, on the Olympic Peninsula cougars and seeing where they go. Thank you. Thank you. Just double check and see if we have any, uh, we just have a lot, we have compliments coming in and it goes, Thank you, thank you. Uh, guys, we'll leave the uh, chat box open for another minute or so. In the meantime, Kurt, as we're wrapping up, anything that you'd like to, to share uh, to, um, to the folks in the East when it comes to the potential reestablishment east of the Mississippi? Yeah, um, I mean, I would encourage uh, approaching this with an open mind. Uh, I think um, cougars are an incredible uh, wildlife species and they, they add a, a lot of depth to the area where you live. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's very neat. Um, I do think that if you live in uh, kind of core cougar habitat, it's important to keep your animals inside and, um, and just be mindful that, that you are uh, in their habitat and they're also in, in yours. Um, uh, yeah, just, um, um, yeah, I, I have, uh, I have high hopes for, for them moving eastward because uh, they're a very successful, um, uh, they're a very successful predator, but, uh, um, yeah, um, just, I would say approach with an open mind. Great advice. Great advice. Okay. Uh, just many more thank yous coming in. Um, we're going to do one last, one last question here. What is your dream technology you would like to use to track cougars? Could you repeat that again? Sure. What is your dream technology that you would like to use to track cougars? Dream technology. That's a really good question um uh i think i think the callers that we're using are are doing a fantastic job in general of of uh um of tracking them and seeing uh seeing where they're where they're dispersing um that's uh it's really difficult to beat that level of technology but um 
I think a lot of the uh, higher end DSLR camera traps produce some incredible images. Um, we do use some of that, but uh, usually we're using um, just uh, uh, run of the mill trail cameras. But I, I, I would be absolutely excited to, to use some of those DSLR camera trap and, uh, to, to get some, some really neat images of, of these cougars. Great, thank you. I, I know the technology is advancing every single year, enabling us to do things with wildlife um, tracking and, and dispersal that was never before considered possible. So that's great. Um, as we wrap everybody, I wanna mention a few things. I wanna thank you all for joining us tonight. I wanna thank you all for bearing with my audio. Thank you for that. And Kurt, just wanna mention, and I hope you can copy me on this, uh, it is very clear to me and to all of us that you're making a difference in the lives of these animals. You're making cutting edge science accessible to all of us. And you're certainly making all those around you very proud. So, Kurt, on behalf of Connecticut Grizzly Zoo, we thank you for your time, your expertise, just spending the evening with us. Keep up the great work. Well, thank you, Jim. And yeah, thanks to everyone for joining. We really, uh, appreciate talking to you all today. Excellent. All right. Have a great night, everybody. We'll see you soon. Okay. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Jim. Good night. Good night.